Experts are predicting that between 2010 and 2050, we are going to lose 50% of all biodiversity on our planet. So first, I'd like to introduce you to Najin and Fatu. Najin and Fatu are northern white rhinos, and they're the very last of their kind. They're mother and daughter. They're guarded 24-7 from poachers. Millions of dollars are spent on IVF and other technologies to try and keep this species from going extinct. And for all the benefits of the conservation technologies that are out there today, these two animals are likely going to be extinct very soon. And currently, in this year alone, about 30,000 species are going to go extinct. Not only that, um, experts are predicting that between 2010 and 2050, we are going to lose 50% of all biodiversity on our planet. Urbanization, over farming, over fishing, 50% of all species wiped off this planet. And it's not just the loss of these beautiful creatures, but there is inherent uh, learnings that we have from these from animals. And we're just now able to read their genomes, understand how they combat various viruses, how they, how they have adapted to deal with diseases. And there's even a company I, I, I saw yesterday that got announced all the funding where they're, they're looking at animals to understand that so that we, they can create drugs for, for humans. So we are, we are losing species. Um, and at Colossal, what our mission is, is to create a de-extinction la lab, library, and basically a toolkit so that we can preserve species, we can bring species back, and we can actually help species adapt to this changing world that we live in. And I think as we go through this, you will see that these technologies um, from the church lab, from our own labs, will have very broad implications uh, to not only you know, animals, but potentially to, to humans as well. Um, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is CRISPR. Uh, and the using CRISPR to uh, really adjust genes in animals to recreate those species that, have been, that we have lost. So why start with the mammoth? Right, there's plenty of other animals to start with. Um, and um, a lot of this is, is driven by uh, Professor Church, who we just heard from, and, and his personal passion, uh, which has been going on for the last uh, almost 10 years, to really look at how can you bring back uh, an extinct species. Um, and this is a hard problem. And uh, when we get later in this presentation, uh, we'll walk through the, very, the various steps uh, that we're working on. But if we solve this, we've solved this for, for any species. And there are a couple other reasons uh, specifically for the mammoth. And, and, when, and let me pause here because when we talk about the mammoth, I want to be clear that this is a cold tolerant elephant hybrid that will look like a mammoth, will have all kind of the, DNA, the expressions of the DNA of a mammoth, but it is a hybrid between an Asian elephant and a mammoth. And as part of that, um, as part of that, it is a new species. It is a new species that can adapt to a different climate, a different environment, uh, and reproduce and, and create herds of, of elephants that are very different than, than what we currently have. One other uh, fact uh, that I want to touch upon is in doing this, Dr. Church and, and his lab um, identified certain viruses uh, that have um, been the leading causes of uh, elephant death in zoos. And the, the largest one is the, the, it's a form of the herpes virus, and it kills, is it, other than you know, humans, it's the leading cause of death for, for elephants. And, uh, as part of 
you know, everything that they're doing with CRISPR, they are going to eradicate the elephants from having that disease and being susceptible to that disease. So as we think about, you know, as we go through and we think about the technologies that are advancing, we can now wipe out, you know, certain types of diseases from any type of animal uh, going forward. Um, so let me, let me talk at a very high level about the, the, the mission as it relates to the mammoth, and then I'll, we can talk a little bit about the science. So uh, Georgia, at the very end of his last uh, presentation, uh, mentioned um, Sergey and Nikita Zimov. Uh, they are two ecologists. Um, you can look at their work. They have videos on YouTube and everything else. Um, they have an area called Pleistocene Park, which is up in Russia. And uh, they have been very big advocates about uh, an impending problem uh, for climate change based on the amount of carbon that is stored uh, in, the, in, in the frozen tundra, uh, in the permafrost. And currently there's about uh, 1,600 billion tons of carbon under the ground uh, that can be released into the atmosphere uh, with, with global warming and the melting of the permafrost. And just to put that in context, currently in all of the atmosphere, there's 800 billion tons. So there's two times more carbon in the ground that can be released than is currently in the atmosphere causing all of the destruction that we're, we're faced today. Uh, and one of the natural ways that they, um, that they are trying to solve this is by having large megafauna uh, just roam. Uh, knock over all the shrubbery, let grass grow, which is one of the big uh, conductors of carbon, and it pushes it down into its roots, and then the grass grows over it, causing the roots to go even further in, into the ground. Uh, but more importantly, they pack the snow. So instead of there being a nice blanket on top of the permafrost, which has the permafrost actually warm, uh, you compact the snow, the permafrost is colder. And it's about two degrees colder. Uh, and what they've done is they've now reintroduced nine different species of megafauna uh, up in Pleistocene Park, and they're actually seeing the results. Uh, and what they have been advocating for for a long time is where is the mammoth? Because <laughs> the mammoth uh, was the largest megafauna. Uh, it would actually uproot the shrubs, knock over the trees that were releasing the carbon, and actually help uh, that entire uh, biosphere. Uh, and so, you know, part of this, as a, as a big mission, there is a, a climate aspect to it, uh, if we can be successful and actually put herds of mammoth uh, back in Pleistocene Park and, and in the tundra. Um, but now let me get a little bit more into the science. So uh, at Colossal, we have a partnership and exclusive license uh, with Harvard for a number of technologies that make up what we refer to as a de-extinction toolkit. Uh, this is everything from multiplex editing, hybrid genomes. It even includes some of the uh, algorithms uh, for multiplex editing. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, it is T-foam technology, which is technology uh, where you use certain protein to turn genes on and off within cells. And it, it is the ability to take any cell in the body and turn that into an egg cell. Now, if you just take a moment and think about that, any cell, take it off your arm, take it off Najin and Fatu, who are you know, being protected right now, and you could then turn that into an egg cell. Far-reaching implications, not only for uh, species preservation, but across many other industries. Um, Another technology is uh, vascularized artificial wombs, and that is the ability to uh, gestate uh, animals, and it could be used beyond that, uh, from, in, from, uh, from very early all the way through uh, the gestation period. So with these technologies, you can sequence genomes, you can have cell lines, you can turn the cell lines into eggs. You can um, stimulate those eggs so they reproduce. You can put them in artificial wombs so then you can gestate. It means you can give rise to life anywhere uh, in any type of environment. I think you mentioned environments that are challenged in many ways. You could have, whether it's 
these types of species we're talking about, farm animals or anything else, you could you know, give life in, in any other environment. So these are the types, types of technologies that are being worked on by Harvard and by our lab. And then as uh, Peter mentioned, um, not only do we have the technology, we're also building software, which I'll talk about in a second because it's a personal passion of mine, but there's also a media component. Um, we, as I mentioned, the mammoth has received a lot of attention and it is uh, you know, changing hearts and minds. We'll get kids and everyone else excited about STEM. Uh, and we are already in talks with the major media companies about doing docu-series and, and following people around as they explore the world and, and bring back new species. Let me talk to you a little bit about software because this is an area of passion of mine. I, I've been a founder of five different software companies. Uh, my other partners have built software, even other software companies. Um, as Dr. Church and his team have been working on the mammoth, they've been pulling data from 55 different databases. The data doesn't talk to each other. They can't use the different data together, right? We saw these beautiful charts on, you know, the improvements on cell and everything else that, that will have positive impact on all of us. But the, the development of software in databases within the genetic research is, is, is it's like, Going back to the software of 1995. Uh, so we have uh, been working diligently on a database layer, data lake, the ability to uh, take all the data, uh, use it, normalize it, uh, provide a no-code uh, user interface, and then create frameworks for predictive models so that as you are looking at gene editing, and you are looking at genomes, and you are looking at uh, looking at what is the effect of the genomes, or where am I going to cut with you know, uh, Cas9 or, or other technologies, uh, how do we do that better? How do we do it faster? How do we have better results and be able to kind of take all of, all of this, this entire industry that is, it, that is booming right now, and how do we accelerate it? And so uh, we've been working diligently on this with uh, data scientists, machine learning experts, uh, even down to the ability to, once you have analyzed and you can look at what a potential combination is, look at the potential protein and the amino acids that come out of it. So pretty exciting stuff, uh, and we're spending a lot of time on this. Um, but it's the other technologies that I think are, are also equally as exciting, and these are more on the wetware and biology side. So I talked uh, a little bit about gametogenesis. And we are focused on gametogenesis as it relates to animals. Um, there are other companies working on looking at this as it relates to humans. And so once again, this is the, the technology of being able to take a cell, uh, apply certain proteins to it, and turn this into an egg cell. So we are looking at this for species con conservation, we are looking at it on how can you, whether it's you know, breeding of species or anything else, uh, there are other companies that are looking at this as it relates to humans, especially if you think about people who have challenges with, the, with their uh, eggs for whatever reason, you can now take a cell off, out of their body and you can create the, the eggs themselves. Uh, this is pretty revolutionary uh, and I think can you know, have dramatic uh, impact not only on species preservation, but also kind of on, on humans as well. Hey, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps get the word out. And if you love the content that I talk about, present about, please subscribe to this channel. And one more thing, don't forget, please give me your comments down below. I love seeing what you think about all of this. We put a lot of time into it with incredible people and would love to have your feedback.